That gate there is the entrance to the European Southern Observatory at Paranal. Paranal is a mountain. That's it there. And if I zoom in on top, you'll see something you might recognise. That's the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. But that's not what we're looking at today. Today we're going to go to where they're going to build the extremely large telescope, which is going to be even bigger than that. And I'll show you exactly where it's going to be. It's going to be there, Cerro Aramazonas, on that peak. Now I'm going to tell you more about it, show you exactly where it's going to be, but it's a 45 minute drive first, so I'm going to get in the car and we're on the way. Talking about EELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope. No, we have actually talked about this before, but what's different now is you've been there, you've actually got to go and see the site. You didn't come. I would have loved to have come, but I was sick, so sadly I was at home and you were getting to visit all these interesting places. As with all things in astronomy, bigger, better, more powerful telescopes. It's big. It's very big. Just to really get an idea of say, the, the chemistry and the atmosphere of an exoplanet, you really need something which is ideally 10 times bigger than the largest ground-based telescopes we have right now. It's going to be the largest telescope in the world. Well, it's been a, it's been a crazy drive so far. If you look back this way, you can just see there, there's Paranel and the VLT. It's quite a way away now. But our destination, well, suddenly that's a whole lot closer. There it is. There's the summit we're about to drive to. You can even see the sort of the track that leads to the top that we're about to drive up, which uh, is going to be interesting. Here's the story. It costs, in round numbers, it costs about a billion euros to build or thereabouts. And so we need a billion euros from somewhere. And it turns out that in t from money that's already been committed from different countries, from money that ESO kind of has in the bank from its annual subscriptions and from savings on other things, they've got about 600 million euros or thereabouts they've identified. When they get to 900 million euros or thereabouts, then they've got 90% of the costs. It's a little more, but they just let's stick with this in round numbers. Um, then that's when you start building, because obviously you don't really want to wait until you've got every last penny before you start building, but equally you can't start building when you're not going to know you're going to have enough money to, to build it. So there's still a gap at the moment. The most likely thing to cover that gap is that Brazil is in the process of signing up as a member of ESO, and its signing up fee is essentially that extra 300 million euros. So as and when Brazil signs on the dotted line, they will actually have enough money to really start building the telescope. Okay, everyone, welcome to the summit of Cerro Aramazonas. I'm aware I pronounce that differently every time. We start off out here. There is Paranal. You can see the VLT vista. You can also see all the support buildings and accommodation. That's where we've driven from. We drove across basically all that desert. You can see some road. Sometimes we're on good road, sometimes not such good road. And we've made it up here to the summit, so let's have a little look around. First of all, let's look at the view out over this side, which is even more spectacular. Desert, mountains, and far in the distance there, there's a mountain called Yuyayako, which is one of the ten highest mountains in the Andes, and the highest ever archaeological remains were found there. So a bit of history. But let's get back to where we are, here on the summit. There's a few, few bits of infrastructure here. There's Laura and Pete. There's a little telescope there. That's being used to monitor the seeing from up here. So they look up the atmosphere, atmospheric conditions, how well you can see the night sky. So they're going to have plenty of data about the seeing here, long before they actually build the ELT. More scientific monitoring over there. And this tower here, again, that's scientific monitoring, weather, temperature, wind, things like that. So they're building up a great big amount of data before they even get here, really. 
and the old marker for the summit. So actually it's it's quite a privilege to be on the summit and there won't be many more people on this summit because when they come around to actually build the ELT they're going to actually blow the summit up in a way. They have to flatten all this. They're going to lower the mountain a bit and make a nice big flat platform for the ELT like they did for the VLT at Paranau. I guess back in the nine, late 1990s, people started thinking about the next generation of telescopes and really going, going up a, a scale. And at that time, ESO had an incredibly ambitious proposal to build a telescope which was going to be 100 metres in diameter. And it actually, it had the best acronym of any telescope ever. It was going to be called OWL, which stood for the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope. And so it would have been really spectacularly huge telescope. And as with any of these processes, the way it works is there's lots of design reviews and lots of people look at it and you get lots of feedback. There are lots of stages along the way of saying, well, can we build this and those kinds of things. And essentially it was considered with OWL that it might have worked, but when you're going to spend that kind of money on something might have worked isn't good enough. You've really got to do all your risk reduction that says it's actually, you know, we really are very confident this really will work, that we have all the technology to do that. So with OWL, there were just too many risks. Um, and so they basically stepped away from that and said, okay, so we can't do that. Let's look at something a little bit more modest in size. And so that led to EELT. Um, at the time, so we started at 100 meters. Then the EELT design, the original design was 42 meters in diameter. Um, I think the answer being 42 wasn't actually any coincidence at all that uh, somebody had a bit of a sense of humor in the process and knew that the answer had to be 42, so they designed a 42 meter telescope. Um, and so that was designed, they went through the entire design process, it was essentially approved, and then we ran up against the cost. It turned out that building a 42 meter telescope was just pushing the cost envelope a little bit too far. It could almost certainly have been built, but it was just too expensive. And it turns out, so the way this telescope is built is it's actually a whole series of one and a half metre um, hexagonal segments that all combine to form this, this mirror, single mirror. And so it turns out there was a relatively easy descope you could do, which is just take away one ring of these one and a half metre diameter hexagonal thing. So that takes you from 42 metres, you lose three metres, you lose one and a half metres offside each side, so that goes from 42 to 39 metres. And it turns out, strangely, it sounds like a very small change, that small change saved a lot of money. So it's, it's due to start construction, we hope, sometime next year. And it's going to take about 10 years to get from that point to actual first light. Of course, I'm happily filming away all the mountains here. What really matters is up there. I mean, one of the real reasons this site was chosen was because of the excellent seeing conditions. We're up here during the day, of course. Night time is when it counts, but there's no way they'd let us drive up here at night. That road was insane. There are things we can do right now, but there are things that we, we still are just beyond our reach. Um, and in fact, there are things which are well beyond our reach. And that's really why I think we've decided to go from, rather than going from 8 metres to 16 metres to 32 metres, uh, we decided to kind of go, to go big uh, at this stage, just so that we, you know, th these things should allow us to do things really to, to, keep, uh, to keep astronomy in, in terms of breakthroughs, at the forefront really for the next 30, 40, 50 years. The original phase of discussion where we were actually talking about the telescope, sites were being looked at all over the world. So the Canary Islands, for example, was one of the possible sites that people looked at where you might build the thing. So people, there were lots of sites were looked at and that the site actually relatively close to where the VLTs are turned out to be the, the, the best for all sorts of reasons, partly because of the quality of the images you get there, partly because actually to run a telescope this big you need quite a lot of infrastructure, you need a lot of power up there just to turn the dome, dome around for example takes a lot of power, you need water, you need people on hand and so on. And so actually you want to build it somewhere relatively remote but actually it's a real advantage to build it relatively close to existing infrastructure and existing observatory because then you haven't got huge amounts of infrastructure you need to build just to support the new telescope. There are a couple of other little observatories around here. There's one run by a local university here in Chile and that one down there is run by Germans. Cool little spot. Apparently there's usually someone there. How would you like to be working there alone? Middle of nowhere. Another interesting fact actually, this mountain was almost chosen as the site for the VLT, which ended up over there. So you know it's pretty good for telescopes. And finally, it's going to get one when they build the ELT. In astronomy, always the, the current generation of telescopes answers a bunch of questions, but always asks a bunch more. There's always these tantalising things that you start to see. 
And so my favourite, I mean, probably the, as far as I'm concerned, probably the single most exciting piece of science with the, the EELT is at the moment we're just starting to see planets around other stars. Okay, we can see that they're there, but we don't know much about them. With the kind of collecting area we'll have with the EELT, we'll actually be able to analyse the light that's being reflected from those planets going around other stars and start studying their atmospheres. And actually even start looking for the molecules you only get in atmospheres where there's life, things called biomarkers. So perhaps, you know, the single most exciting piece of science I could envisage doing with the EELT is saying not only is there a planet around that star there, but actually there's life on it. I was told you very rarely see wildlife here, but there you go, there's a bird on top of the little telescope. This is just a cool little spot that we've stopped halfway between Paranal and the ELT site. So, so you can see Paranal up there. The ELT site you can't see at the moment, it's, it's up half past that Martian ridge. But a really cool Martian landscape here, just worth a little look.